the cure for obesity. This is one of a series of videos that can be found on the website about cancer.com. A better title perhaps would be Solving the Obesity Epidemic by Changing Our Relationship to Food and Our Response to Hunger. This is actually part two of this series. This will talk about conventional diets and nutritional advice and why they have not been successful in helping people lose weight. The first video is about understanding obesity and the health consequences. And part three is a new approach on helping people lose weight. Again, all of this can be found on the website about cancer.com. Treatment or management or prevention of obesity. People have been complaining about this for over a century. Mark Twain said it quite well. The only way to keep your health is to eat what you don't want, drink what you don't like, and do what you'd rather not. Jackie Gleason uh, probably said it best about diets. The second day of a diet is always easier than the first. By the second day, you're off it. So simply telling people to go on a diet has not been a popular or successful solution. If you looked at part one of this series, there were lots of data on the statistics of who is overweight or obese. But it would point out that a third of the population is not overweight. And for whatever reason, their autopilot balances quite nicely their intake of fuel with their expenditure of energy. However, two-thirds of the population is overweight and their bodies accumulate excessive and unwanted fat. So how to help these people? Obesity is definitely genetic. The heritability is said to be 75%, second only to height. But it's also contagious. By heritability, they've identified a number of genetics or alleles related to obesity. This is a distribution of these. And it shows the red line. The more of these alleles you have, the more genetic obesity genes that you have, the higher the odds are that you'll be overweight. But obesity is also contagious from the Framingham data studies. The odds of obesity is increased by 57% if your friend becomes obese, if 40% of a sibling becomes obese, and 30% if your spouse becomes obese. So you are influenced, obviously, by your community or your social group. Now, the establishment advice has been the same for years. Eat less, make better food choices, and increase exercise. But this has not lowered the incidence of obesity. Obesity prevalence has remained somewhat stable over the last 10 years, perhaps, but has increased slightly among men overall and among black women and Mexican-American women. The best advice from the government or the NIH is shown on this recent study in 2013. The references and the whole study are, can be linked from the website. Under this, the obvious question, which diets work, they said a variety of dietary approaches will produce weight loss, and they listed 15 successful diets. They just listed them in alphabetic order. They said they're all associated with weight loss as long as you reduce your dietary energy intake. In other words, keep the calories in below the calories that you expend with your metabolism. If you said, why so many diets? Well, we all have different tastes. Howard Moskowitz is a pioneering marker researcher and psychologist who helped the food industry optimize food. He was notable for his optimization of the amount of salt, sugar, and fat to put in spaghetti sauce to reach what they called a bliss point, which maximized consumer satisfaction. So he's vilified by dietary people in helping the food industry addict us to all their food. Malcolm Gladwell has a very flattering video about Moskowitz showing how clever he is. If you go to Moskowitz's website, Mind Genomics, he discusses the fact that we are so multiple genes in our minds and that we all have very different tastes and that perhaps finding the optimal diet also would be helpful in letting us lose weight. Up to date, which is a summary of current research publications, basically says that it's possible to lose 5 to 7% of your weight. Many types of diets will work as long as you reduce your energy intake below energy expenditure, so calories do count. 
They say if you go on a low carbohydrate diet, then choose healthy fats, mono, polyunsaturated, and healthy proteins, fish, nut, legumes, poultry. They say if you choose to go on a low fat diet, then choose healthy carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, whole grains. And I think that's all good advice as well. Probably the best advice is from Walter Willett, who's headed up the Harvard School of Public Health for years. The video listed here is particularly good, and there are many other good videos and lectures from him online. He's in charge of the Nurses Health Study and the Long-Term Health Professional Study. It is worth pointing out, however, that these long-term nutrition studies prove correlation but not causation. And so things may be correlated or connected, but one doesn't cause the other. And this does leave this kind of data open to misinterpretation. But he did find some very useful stuff. For instance, they found that the worst fat is trans fat. And since this came out a number of years ago, there has been an effort to reduce trans fat in most foods. You can see on this graph that saturated fats, the green line, are not particularly harmful. And the recently the USDA has finally realized that. He found that red meat is not so good. The higher the red meat consumption, quartile fifth, five, or quintile five means you're in the highest meat group. They have the worst mortality, so he encourages you to avoid red meat. Though paradoxically, he shows data in Asia where eating red meat is a good thing, though he interprets that as, as meaning people who can afford red meat are probably healthier for multiple other reasons, just on economics. He did show, and I think this is useful, that high glycemic load food is bad. The best group would be the, white, the yellow box on the lower right corner. Low glycemic food with high fiber. And the worst thing for your health would be a high glycemic food with low fiber. He also found that a high glycemic food in people who are already overweight is particularly bad for your heart. And that's the red box in the upper right corner. And there are other studies from the New England Journal, again, no surprise, that show people who tend to eat fruit, nuts, and yogurt are much less likely to gain weight than people who eat potato fries and potato chips. And they did come out with their own food guidelines, which I think are very helpful. And the link here will take you to these guidelines what type of vegetables, fruit, whole grains, and healthy proteins to eat. Alcohol was mentioned, but alcohol is sort of a difficult thing to advise. The truth is, eat, drinking one or two drinks a day is actually good for you. This is for men. Not only is there a lower coronary risk, but all-cause risk for someone who drinks to up to two drinks a day is lower than people who don't drink alcohol at all. In women, it's a little more complicated because of breast cancer and other things that are clearly related to alcohol. One drink is considered a 12 ounce beer, five ounces of wine, or one hard liquor is noted here. And so the guidelines from the CDC avoid binge drinking, heavy drinking, obviously pregnant women, underage children. They do say if you drink at all, one drink a day for women, up to two drinks a day for men. David Katz is a Yale nutrition researcher, and he has a number of excellent videos and articles online, which I would strongly recommend. He developed the new Val nutritional scoring system, and there should be an app available soon where you can scan in any food at the grocery store, and it'll tell you the quality of the nutrition. He emphasizes six things rather than three. Don't smoke, eat well, and exercise, but he also emphasizes coping with stress, getting proper sleep, and having some sort of a social life. But all six of those are important pieces of good advice. And he discusses the mechanism of epigenetics and how that's affecting our health. And I do discuss this in more detail in the first lecture. But despite all the good advice, the trends are still going up to some degree. And it's noted in the first video, it's expected that by 2030, 50% of the U.S. population will be obese. And the USDA guidelines have been, been particularly unhelpful. Since the guidelines came out, obesity has gotten up much higher. And the U.S. ranks at the top of wealthy countries as having the worst obesity. Then Mexico is trying to pull ahead now. 
1972, Atkins came out and pointed out that it was probably carbohydrates and sugars that were the enemy, not fats, though he was roundly condemned by the USDA. And in the 90s, the South Beach Diet Sugar Busters, the zone, came out and made the same arguments. All of this was very good advice, but the USDA fought them uh, consistently and has up until recently still recommended diets high in carbohydrates. If you wonder, could the USDA have misled us? Excellent books by Gary Tobbs and by Nina Teichotz basically explore all the corruption and politics and bad science behind all the bad advice we've been getting from the USDA. And so people have felt the need to go on their own, and of course there are thousands of diet books. And so the question comes up, should you continue to advise conventional wisdom diet, better food choices, moderate calorie reduction, plus exercise and behavior modification, or try to come up with something new or different? And you go back to the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Is it fair to blame the patient for everything? There are probably some limits to personal responsibility. This is a quote by George Bray, who is also an excellent researcher in the field of diet and nutrition. He says you can't keep blaming the poor patient. Simply saying to people who are overweight or obese, eat less and exercise more is about as effective as telling a patient with chronic depression to have a nice day. And so part three is my new approach to helping people lose weight and avoid regaining all the lost weight. All three of these lectures are on the website aboutcancer.com and the links to all the references can be found there as well.